but at least you know that it's coming. All right, let's open our Bibles to the book of Philippians. We're in Philippians chapter 1. Still. And next week we'll be in Philippians chapter 1. Still. So, uh, by way of quick review, in our last study, uh, Paul finally begins to inform the Philippian believers of his present condition, the, his situation that he was in. But he, he doesn't do so in the form of a complaint, nor does he even present it to them as a matter of concern or, or a matter of prayer. Paul knows that they're, they're, they are praying for him. But what Paul's doing in uh, verses, well, we started last week in verse 12, but... Uh, beginning in, uh, in verse 12, Paul begins to uh, share with them uh, what, he's, what he's going through. And, and what he's going through is actually he's introducing the theme of rejoicing even in the midst of difficult circumstances, much like uh, you know, if you happen to be in prison, uh, which Paul was. And yet he was still able to rejoice. Paul contends that Though his current life status was completely unexpected, and if you think about it, it was completely unwarranted because Paul hadn't broken any laws, and yet there he was in prison. Uh, these difficult circumstances had actually resulted in the gospel being carried to places in Roman society that Paul had never dreamed would be possible. But just as quickly as he begins this theme of rejoicing in difficult circumstances, uh, Paul makes a, a brief digression uh, concerning the motives that some individuals had in Rome for their evangelism. And this is not by, by accident. We, you, know, you might look at this and say, well, it's kind of odd to throw that in there, but uh, it, it is not. It actually serves an important Purpose, because it, it seems that there is a hint here of uh, some degree of division or some degree of conflict that was existing in the Philippian church itself. And Paul is going to deal with this later, but here in these, uh, the passage that we looked at last week, Paul is simply laying the groundwork. He is paving the way. Uh, to address this situation by, by first and foremost showing his own attitude towards Christians who are actually opposing him. And his attitude is, well, if they're preaching the gospel, they're preaching the gospel. Uh, and, and the inference here is if he, Paul, who is in prison, can rejoice even over his own critics, he can rejoice over his own detractors, Surely the Philippians can deal kindly with each other in their, uh, in their own disagreements. But again, this is not just Paul putting a, a nice face on a bad situation. Paul could honestly and sincerely possess this attitude because Paul had his eye on a much bigger picture. <coughs> Paul was looking at something much bigger than a, than a picture of himself. He was looking at something much bigger than, a, than an image of his, the life that he desired, the life that he wanted, the life that he expected. Paul is not really concerned with those things. Paul's divine calling, Paul's divine commission was to preach the gospel. And specifically, it was to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Of course, Paul would preach to anybody. But uh, he was specifically called to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. And so in Paul's mind, any opposition that he got from other believers, it could be tolerated if it led to the furtherance of the gospel, which was the primary goal of his life. So Paul didn't care how it happened, just as long as it happened. He wasn't concerned with who received the credit for uh, sharing the gospel. He wasn't concerned with, uh, you know, 
if it was me or somebody else, uh, I got to do it, I got to do it. No, Paul's just like, let's, let's just get the gospel out there. All that mattered to him was that the true gospel was spread and that sinners were brought to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that's why he can say these things. Now, I'll guarantee you, if they, if they were teaching a false gospel, Paul would have a few things to say. And he wouldn't be so uh, reserved in his comments. And we, we, if you, if you want to know what Paul had to say, all you have to do is read the book of Galatians. He's very forthcoming in his condemnation of people that want to change the gospel. But in our text today, uh, Paul returns to the theme of rejoicing, but he actually develop it, he develops it uh, even further. Let's look, and let's just read both verses and then we'll, uh, we'll kick them around for a little bit. We're going to look at verses 19 and 20 today um, because there's a lot here. And Paul says in verse 19, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. And we can see just at that last verse, all Paul is concerned about is Jesus Christ is magnified. And he says it doesn't matter how that happens, whether I live or I die, whatever happens, as long as it magnifies Jesus Christ, then it will turn out for the good. But in verse 19... We see that despite Paul's continued imprisonment, uh, despite his impending trial before Caesar Nero, uh, an individual that is not known for being level-headed uh, and, and honest, in spite of all this, Paul knew that the Lord was in control of all of the events of his life, and because the Lord was in control of all of the events of his life, Paul is certain that his present dark circumstances would eventually work out well. He knows it's, it's going to turn out to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. Now, we might logically assume that Paul is referring in uh, verse 19 here to maybe an acquittal before Caesar. But that's not necessarily clear in this passage. The Greek word that Paul uses, the word that is translated deliverance, is the, the Greek word soteria. And if you're a theologian, you automatically know that soteria in Greek simply means salvation. And, and for, uh, in theology, the study of the subject of salvation is called soteriology. You know, like, how in the world is that? Well, it's because that's the Greek word. So you know how theologians are. They like to make it difficult for everybody else. So. Uh, but it is translated as in, in, in the scriptures, most of the time, soteria is translated as salvation or healing or vindication or wholeness. And, of course, all of those words encompass our ultimate salvation. You might think, well, you know, I'm saved, but I'm not necessarily healed. I'm struggling. Well, one of these days you will be completely healed. Uh, I'm saved, but the world is coming against me and, and they're accusing me falsely. But guess what? One day you will be vindicated and you will be vindicated by God. Uh, I'm saved, but I'm still broken. Yes, that's true of all of us. But one day we will be completely made whole. And so for Paul, the word soteria... It's generally something that occurs at the end of days, you know, in the day of the Lord. Something in the future. It refers to the final, ultimate salvation that comes with God's acquittal of His people before His throne. It comes with the complete healing that we will experience in the final resurrection. You know, when we are raised up and we receive our glorified bodies, then there will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering there will be complete healing so what is paul referring to here is he referring to just get his get out of jail quick uh or is he referring to something in the the future 
Well, we can throw this in the mix. Paul's phrase in, in verse 19 is actually a direct quote from the Septuagint. Does anybody know what the Septuagint is? Well, uh, the Septuagint is a, just a really big word that means the Greek Old Testament. You see, in, in Paul's day, most everybody spoke Greek. Very few people spoke Hebrew. And so in order to be able to read the Old Testament, they had to have it in their language. And so they, uh, they wrote, uh, they translated the, the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, and that is known as the Septuagint. And Paul's uh, quote here, his, his, his phrase here is actually a direct quote from Job chapter 13, verse 16. And of course, I'm tra uh, somebody translated it from Greek into English. But basically, the English version of the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures says this. Is that a long enough string there? Uh, Even this will turn out for my deliverance, is what Job said. And so, in the passage in the book of Job, he is declaring his certainty that his present undeserved suffering, and we know Job's situation, I hope you know Job's situation, his suffering was extensive, but it was also undeserved. And Job had the presence of mind to understand that even in the midst of his undeserved suffering, he will in the end be vindicated by God. And, and that's exactly what happened. Of course, Job didn't have to wait until the end of his life. It happened right there at the end of that certain episode. And so Paul knows that this will also be the case for him, even though he is not sure if his trial before Nero will end in his life, in a, an acquittal, or his death in an execution. That's what he's referring to in verse 20. Whether by life or by death. It doesn't matter because Paul is confident that whether he lives or whether he dies, he is going to stand before God as someone who is innocent. And more than that, Paul is confident that his life testimony will have done credit to the gospel as he proclaims it boldly even while he's in prison. See, Paul lives his life with, with no regrets. And if his life was taken from him, Paul was sure that he had lived his life as God had called him to do it. Uh, circumstances change. The situation changes. Things happen that we don't expect. That's all right. God expected it. God knew it was going to happen. But while we cannot be certain if Paul, if Paul is referring to a, a, a near acquittal from Nero or a distant acquittal and glorification before God, what we can be certain of is that Paul was certain that the Philippians themselves had a role to play in his deliverance. Now, what do you mean? Well, look what he says here in verse 19 again. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through what? Through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul was certain of this because he knew that the Philippians were praying for him, and Paul honestly believed that his deliverance from his present situation was somehow connected to their prayers. Now, here's the $100,000 question. Can we actually say that if the Philippians failed to pray for Paul, that his deliverance would be hindered? Hmm, that's a good question. It would be hard for us to say that, you know, because if God wanted him to be delivered, well, what would it matter? But it certainly seems that Paul thought this way. It, it looks like Paul was attaching his deliverance and connecting it somehow to the prayers of the Philippians. But even without a definite answer to that very important question, this verse still shows us what a serious matter prayer actually is. You know, a lot of times we approach prayer as, eh, we can take it or leave it. You know, if I need to pray, I'll pray. But I pretty much got this. But that's not how Paul approached prayer. Prayer was vital 
Prayer was vital. And, and even if we don't understand the relationship between God's work in our life and our prayer, it still gives us no right to disregard prayer because God tells us in His Word to be praying always. So there is a reason for it. There is power in prayer, even if we don't understand it. I don't understand much about electricity. All I do is flick on the light and there it works. And if it doesn't work, well, then I got a problem. I have to start figuring things out. But there is power in prayer, and there is a connection between our prayers and the work of God in our life. Still, even having said that, it wasn't necessarily the prayers of the Philippians in and of themselves that was going to meet Paul's needs. In truth, what Paul really needed, what Paul desired most, was that the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ would come to him in a fresh measure at this time. Paul needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul needed to experience the filling of the Holy Spirit. He needed to see uh, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit manifested with him in this time. Because Paul knew that ultimately his needs were met by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. But he also realized that this provision of the Spirit was going to be facilitated in part through the prayers of the Philippians. Basically, Paul's saying, look, I need you to pray for me, and I need you to pray specifically in this way. That the Holy Spirit would come upon me in a greater measure. See, the reality is, is that God gives the Holy Spirit to his people, and he does so constantly. I think, well, if he, if he gives it to us once, why do we need it? Well, there's, there's certain levels of, uh, or there's certain aspects of the filling of the Holy Spirit. On the, on the one hand, we immediately get the Holy Spirit as soon as we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, right? That is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He becomes the, what Paul says, the down payment of our ultimate salvation. How do we know we're going to be saved? Because we have the Holy Spirit. But yet there's also a separate filling of the Holy Spirit. That, uh, the, that, that fills us uh, on a daily basis. And we need to be filled on a daily basis. And we all know why. Because we leak. We leak. We are broken vessels. And the Holy Spirit just pours right out of us. And we need to be filled constantly. And that's what Paul is praying for. That the Holy Spirit would manifest Himself in his life in that situation. God gives the Spirit to His people and he does so constantly but he also does so in response to prayer and the demands of whatever situation we happen to find ourselves in but here again we see the idea of cooperation with God cooperate cooperating with him in his work and it is through prayer that his people become co-laborers they become sharers in the work of God and God works in us and through us as we are prepared to share in that work you say well you know God hadn't done a whole lot in me God hasn't done a whole lot with me or through me well how have you prepared yourself you know what steps are you taking to uh, to make that happen it's because God desires to do so but he's not going to use us in a situation that we're not prepared to handle. And that preparation comes through prayer. It comes through Bible study. It comes through uh, experiencing and walking with the Lord on a daily basis. And so Paul is sure that his situation, as dark as it looked, he is sure that it would turn out to be just fine. One way or another, it's going to be just fine. But look at verse 20. Verse 20 is where we really want to uh, camp out today. Because Paul says, According to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Now, Paul is talking about something here that we don't necessarily catch uh, right away. 
Uh, and it has to do with the English translation of uh, what's going on here. But I'm, I'm going to make a statement that we're all familiar with. That I, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here. But if you have lived at any length of time, you realize that there is a great deal of disappointment experienced in this life. As a matter of fact, disappointment is just part of being human. It's an experience that is common to the human condition. I mean, we learn disappointment early in life. When, as children, we fail to get, you know, things that we want. <laughs> you know, I wanted that toy for Christmas. Uh, or I wanted this, or I wanted that. Kids want a lot, right? Yeah. And so you learn early. As you mature, it's almost as if life is just a progression of every, ever-changing disappointments, you know. They get bigger and bigger, more important, uh, harder to deal with. Uh, there's, there's disappointments in employment, in, in business transactions, in our relationships, in our life goals. You know, as your kid, you have all your, your life planned out ahead of you, some of you. Eh, doesn't necessarily turn out that way. We know that. Everything in the human experience is stained with disappointment. And this is uh, no more true than uh, in this example of uh, of the last song that we sang today. It's probably one of my favorites. Uh, it is well with my soul. Has anybody ever heard the backstory to that? It was written by a man named Horatio G. Spafford. Uh, he was a successful lawyer and a businessman in Chicago in the late 19th century. He had a lovely wife, five young children, but this wonderful family was no stranger to tears and tragedy. Their only son died of pneumonia in 1871. And in that same year, much of their business was destroyed in the Great Chicago Fire. In 1873, Mrs. Spafford and her four daughters sailed to Europe on a French ocean liner. While Mr. Spafford was delayed in Chicago with some unexpected business problems and his plan was to follow them on another ship a few days later. Well, four days into the crossing, the French ocean liner collided with another ship. That's always unfortunate. Within 12 minutes, that French ocean liner sank into the dark waters of the Atlantic along with 226 passengers, including their four children. And Miss Bafford was pulled alive from the water and eventually she made it to Wales she wired a telegram to her husband saying, Saved alone, what shall I do? And so right away he booked passage on the next available ship to, uh, to join his grieving wife. And of course when the ship was about four days out, the captain called Mr. Spafford into his cabin and informed him. that they were crossing the spot where his children went down. I can't imagine. I can't imagine living with that. But uh, according to uh, one of his daughters that was born after this tragedy, Mr. Spafford wrote this song while he was on that journey. Now that, of course, is an extreme example of disappointment and suffering. And yet, in verse 20, what Paul is telling us here is that there is no disappointment with God. Now wait a minute. <laughs> what, what did we just talk about? How in the world can Paul say this? Um, because Paul carried the gospel of Jesus Christ through much of the Roman Empire, and now he was imprisoned in Rome. He wanted to preach the gospel in the western part of the empire, but instead of this, it looks like he may soon be executed for his faith. And from a human perspective, everything seemed to be going against him. But despite this, Paul remains confident that God's purpose for his life will not be shaken. And so, to understand what Paul is saying in verse 20, in this verse we need to understand what the word ashamed 
means. See, the word ashamed in the Bible didn't always have the meaning uh, that it has for us today, those that used it. The primary biblical meaning is not even in most of our modern dictionaries. Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary defines shame as a painful emotion excited by a consciousness of guilt. We all understand that. It is a disgrace or it is a dishonor. Uh, basically, when you make a fool of yourself publicly, yeah, you are ashamed. Uh, I was watching a short little video of the most embarrassing plays in baseball. And, and, and what it, uh, you know, it, it's unimaginable. Uh, an outfielder, you know, you got two guys on base and a pop fly and the outfielder snags it. And he turns around and just chucks the ball into the, into the stands for the fans, not realizing that they only had two outs. And so those guys that were on base just trot home because he just threw a live ball into the, into the crowd. And he's got to stand there in front of his team, in front of everybody that's in the stadium, in front of everybody that's watching on TV and look like a fool. Now that is embarrassing just because he can't count. We understand embarrassment. But this is not the biblical understanding of shame. The biblical understanding has to do with disappointment. According to Scripture, the person who is not ashamed, the person who will not be ashamed, is the one whose trust is not misplaced. It's the one who will never be disillusioned because they are trusting in something that is true, that is real. And so what Paul says here that in nothing I shall be ashamed, what he is actually stating is that in nothing will I be disappointed. Obviously, he's not referring to the physical aspects of his life, his expectations. What he's referring to is God's will being accomplished in his life. And Paul knows that he is not going to be disappointed. This meaning is clear in several important places in the Bible. In Romans 5.5, 5, Paul writes about Christian hope, saying that hope does not disappoint. Another verse that requires this translation is in Isaiah 29, or Isaiah, excuse me, 49, verse 23. Uh, this passage is quoted twice in the book of Romans. And here God says, Then you will know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed, they shall not be disappointed who wait for me. And yet there are three specific verses in the Bible that explain in greater detail the great ways in which God does not disappoint His people. Uh, each of the three contains the word ashamed, and, and each of them teach that there is no shame or no disappointment for believers. The first one is in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, a verse we know very well. And Paul declares that I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For the Jew first and also for the Gentile. Now what Paul is saying in Romans 1.16 is that he has never been disappointed in the gospel. He has never been disappointed by the gospel. Because wherever and whenever the gospel is preached, then the power of God accompanies it and it produces supernatural results. Now, again, it didn't always do what Paul wanted it to do. But there was always good that came out of it. But here's the next question. What in the world is the gospel? And why is it so powerful? Well... The gospel is simply this. It's the message of God's grace revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. And the message of the gospel is centered on his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians. But notice Paul in Romans 1.16 speaks of the power of the gospel. And he is writing this to the believers in the city of Rome which Rome was built on power. Now, Paul was unique 
He was a unique individual in his day because Paul was entirely comfortable. He was completely at home in three very conflicting cultures. Paul was at home in the Jewish culture. He was at home in the Greek culture. He can make himself at home in the Roman culture as well. What's more, Paul successfully preached the gospel to each one of these diverse groups. But each of these groups had a particular difficulty in receiving the gospel. The Jews, they, they came, uh, it was implanted in them. Uh, it was in them when they were born. The Jews came with centuries of religious training, centuries of uh, tradition that they weren't willing to turn from. They lived in an inflexible, fixed spiritual system. This is the way it is. This is the way it has always been. This is the way it will always be. And you see, Jesus Christ had no place in their religious system. And thus, for the Jews, Jesus was, as Paul says, he was a stumbling block. And it was necessary for Paul to show the Jews that Jesus, far from being a stumbling block, was actually God's foundation for the entire structure of revealed religion that they had. Jesus was the whole point of their religion, and they failed to see that. And Paul had to convince them, he had to uh, teach them that. The Greeks were a little bit different. The Greeks didn't pride themselves on religious traditions. They didn't, they didn't have any. <clears throat> the Greeks were proud of their wisdom. They were proud of the, the tradition they had of intellect. And uh, they traced their intellectual ancestry to individuals like Homer and Plato and Aristotle, the Cynics. And the Epicureans. There was a long line of very intelligent people that uh, the Greeks had given the world. And each one of these systems of belief, each one of these systems of knowledge competed with one another. And all of them predated Paul. All of them predated Jesus Christ. So as far as the Greeks were concerned, Christianity was uh, Johnny come lately. <clears throat> And most of these systems of knowledge that the Greeks held to, uh, they, they taught uh, that there was an unbridgeable gap between the spiritual world and the physical world. Uh, there was an unbridgeable gap between God and between man. And so, uh, <clears throat> to the Greeks, any preaching that dealt with the birth and the death and the resurrection of God's Son was foolishness to them. So God wouldn't have anything to do with humanity. God wouldn't touch us with a 10-foot pole. But Paul needed to show them that the cross of Jesus Christ was actually the wisdom of God, a wisdom that exposes the foolishness of human understanding. Now the Romans, yeah, they were a little different. They didn't take pride in their religious traditions or their supposed knowledge or wisdom. The Romans took pride in their power. It was the power of Rome's legions that had conquered the civilized world. And it was the, the strong arm of Rome that guaranteed Roman justice throughout the conquered dominions. And to the Romans, this was real power to hold sway over the lives of millions of people. And yet the gospel of Jesus Christ to them was weakness. Your God died on a cross. And Paul had to show them the gospel was actually the power of God himself. The gospel possesses a power that does not disappoint the believer. It does not disappoint the Christian. The word Paul uses for power in Romans chapter 1, 16, it's not the Greek word exousia, uh, this word refers to power that comes from authority. Uh, it's also not kratos, which is the, the naked power of rule, uh, which could be exercised with or without legitimate authority. You know, if someone takes over, yeah, they got the power to do it, yeah, go for it. The, the word that Paul uses is dynamis. Dynamis. 
which gives us the explosive words like dynamite and dynamo and, and dynamic. Uh, this is the word that Paul commends the gospel of Christ to the power conscious Romans. The power of God is explosive. It's overpowering. Paul says that it's the effective, it's explosive power of God. He knew the gospel would always accomplish the purpose for which God sent it forth. You know what? It still does that today. It has not changed. Its power has not been diminished. It's the power of the gospel that takes the native from the jungles of South Africa and frees him from the slavery of superstition and fear. And it makes him, it turns him into a missionary of Jesus Christ to other tribes around him. Tribes before that he would try to kill people with. Now he's trying to save them. It's the power of the gospel that takes the immoral reprobate and gives them a purpose in life in which they can contribute to society instead of tearing it down. Anybody's ever heard of Billy Sunday? Billy Sunday was a, uh, a well-known evangelist in the early 1900s, late 1800s. But before he was saved, he was a drunkard. And he was such a drunkard that uh, he, he drank all the... All, he, he used up all the money that he had and uh, his, his little daughter died from an illness because they didn't have money to uh, take her to the doctor. And at her funeral, he stole the shoes off of her feet so he could go buy more alcohol. Uh, and we think of a person like that, you've got to be kidding. But God saved even him and changed his life. And he was used by God to change the lives of so many other people. That's the power of the gospel. It's a power that turns pious, hypocritical churchgoers into prophets and witnesses for Jesus Christ. The gospel can change you. It can transform your life. And the gospel can satisfy your deepest spiritual longings. Now the second verse that tells how God won't disappoint us is found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. And Paul says in 2 Timothy 1.12, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Now, the idea in this verse, the, I, the concept that Paul is using here is that of banking. And what the verse actually means is that God has the power to keep everything that I have deposited with him. And that's an important thing, you know. That's what we look for in a bank. Somebody that can keep that money safe. Every now and then we hear of some financial bigwig, some tycoon who has engaged in dishonest practices and whose financial empire has collapsed overnight. Can we say uh, Bernie Madoff? Can we say Enron? Oh my goodness. A man like this often has, they, they've sold stock to unsuspecting people while, while pushing the price of the stock to unrealistic heights through dishonest dealings. Uh, the value is there on paper, but there's nothing to back it up with. There's, there, there is no value in reality. All the warehouses turn out to be vacant lots. The storage tanks are all empty. Uh, the, uh, the tycoon has no power to preserve what has been committed to him. And all that the stockholders have invested is lost beyond recovery. All right. Sorry. Can't get it back. Wasted away. Why is that? Because they, they invested in something that wasn't real. But that's not how God operates. See, today people insist on placing their spiritual deposits onto things that cannot protect them. They, they invest in religious cults. They invest in religion itself. They invest in schemes for world government. They invest in dreams of human betterment. And all of those things, I guarantee you, all of those things will fail you. They will fail the investor because only God 
is able to guarantee our deposits better than the FDIC. He's more reliable. Have you trusted in God through faith in Jesus Christ? If you have, just think. Think of the capital investments that you have placed on deposit with him. You put in him your faith for salvation in eternity. And can God keep that? Well, yes, he can. Absolutely he can. John 10, verses 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. That's a pretty, uh, pretty clear statement there. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have nothing to fear. We, can, we should fear no loss in Jesus Christ. Have, you have also placed your faith in the fact that God can accomplish His purposes in your life. Can, can God keep that? Well, of course He can. We've already looked at that. In uh, Ephesians uh, 2, uh, verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Not only did God prepare the good works, but He's preparing us to walk in them. It's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. Not only that, we have committed to Him our faith that He can see us through temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation is overtaking you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Certainly, without a doubt, God is able to keep our capital investments. Those assets that we have placed in Him, God is able to protect them and God is able to increase them. And one day we'll see those returns. And guess what? We don't have to wait for those returns. We see them even today. Just think about the marvelous dividends that God pays on our investments. It's not just that we're secure in Him for this life. Uh, it's not even that we're secure in Him for the life to come. But we partake of uh, the blessings of God even today. And we partake of them so richly. We have today, we have His love. We experience His joy. We experience a peace that passes understanding. And a thousand other things besides. That's a whole other sermon. But here's the thing. God delights in paying those dividends. God delights in blessing His people and those who delight in Him. Now, some of those payments are major, all right? Some things happen and we're like, oh my goodness, look what God has done. Uh, they're, they're amazing and we rejoice in them. But a lot of the dividends that God's, God pays in our life, they're, they're kind of hard to see because they are small. But they're there and they're consistent and, and every day He is blessing us, every day. And those small blessings are just as amazing. And oftentimes they're entirely unexpected. And yet God works. How many times have we left the house, you know, and, and, and 10 minutes later there's an accident where you just passed by? You know, we don't know. Sometimes I come back to the house and I'm like, ooh, I was right there. They say most accidents happen within seven miles of your home so I moved I didn't want to live near that home but uh, <clears throat> but how can we not be grateful to such a loving and, and detail oriented heavenly father the one that even takes the smallest aspects of our life and turns them into blessings and besides this God's daily dividends are just more evidence that he is 
guarding our spiritual deposits. We see the evidence of it every day. And of course, the third verse that tells how God will not disappoint us is found in our text, Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. Paul again is on trial for his life. But the, the outcome is uncertain only from a human perspective. On the spiritual level, Paul knows that whatever is going to happen is going to work out for his salvation. Paul will not be ashamed. He will not be disappointed because he knows that Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. <laughs> Paul didn't matter. One way or the other. Christ is going to be magnified. One way or the other, Christ is going to be glorified, and I will not be disappointed. But, but let's just consider the scope of his statement. <clears throat> First, Paul knew, he was confident, that Jesus Christ would be magnified. See, Paul lived in a, in a society, he lived in an environment where pagan gods were worshipped, and all the power, all the political power, seemed to be on the side of pagan Rome. But Paul knew that Jesus Christ would ultimately be exalted. He knew that Jesus Christ would ultimately rule the world in power until he had crushed all of his enemies beneath his feet. And we see this in several different passages. And this was the basis of Paul's confidence. Paul knew that in the end, Jesus Christ wins. So, why worry? Secondly, Paul knew that God's determination to exalt Jesus Christ also extends to those who are united to Jesus Christ in faith. You see, Paul didn't just say that Christ would be magnified. Paul said that Christ would be magnified in him in his life. And if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, you should understand that the Father is just as determined to exalt you as he is to exalt his Son. We saw that in, in verse 6. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He desires to make something great out of each one of us. And this is one more thing in which, the, in which the believer will not be disappointed. And thirdly, Paul recognized that Jesus Christ would be magnified in him whether he lived or whether he died. Paul was so confident that, that God's will for him was perfect. Paul was confident that God's will was the best possible thing for him, that he was able to accept it willingly, even if it meant death at the hands of of a Roman executioner. Paul wasn't worried about that. He just wanted Jesus Christ to be magnified. And if that's what does it, then that's what does it. It's hard for us to imagine that kind of attitude, that kind of mindset. You see, when life is smooth, when life is easy, when everything's going our way, it's easy to say all things work together for good to those who love God. It's easy to say that when you have everything you want. It's easy to say that when God blesses you and your family. But it's not so easy to say this from a hospital bed. It's not so easy to say it from the graveside. It's not so easy to say this in the face of bitter disappointment and pain. But even in these times, even in that bitter disappointment, even in the midst of that pain, it is still no less true. It's just as true in the difficult times as it is in the good times. If you want to have confidence in God in the midst of difficult times, you must learn to trust Him, even in the small disappointments of life. We have just a little bit of time, and I don't normally do this, but I, I found a story that fits perfectly with this lesson. I, I just want to read it to you. I'm going to try to read hurriedly, and we'll skip over some of it. But uh, So just get this in your mind. In 1921, anybody was around then? Yeah, no, almost. <laughs> David and Svea Flood 
went with their two-year-old son from Sweden to the heart of Africa, uh, which at that time was called the Belgian Congo. Uh, this uh, missionary couple met up with another couple called, uh, named the Ericsons. Uh, they were also from Scandinavia, and the four of them uh, sought God for direction, and in those days of devotion and sacrifice, they felt led of the Lord to <clears throat> set out from the main mission station and to take the gospel to the village of Indolera, uh, which was in a remote area. And so obviously this was a huge step of faith for four white people that didn't know the language. <clears throat> but the problem was when they got there, they were rebuffed by the chief of the village. He would not let them enter the village because he was afraid that uh, they would alienate all of the local gods that they worshipped. And so the, the two couples decided to build their own mud huts half a mile up the slope. They prayed for a spiritual breakthrough, but there was none. The only contact that they had with the villagers was through a small uh, a young boy who was allowed to sell them chickens and eggs twice a week. And so Sevilla Flood, a tiny woman of uh, only four feet, eight inches, decided that if this was the only African she could talk to, then she was going to try to lead the boy to Jesus, and she succeeded. So they had one convert. <laughs> Meanwhile, malaria struck one member of the little missionary band after another. In time, the, the Ericsons decided they had had enough suffering, and they, they left the area to return to the central mission station. Uh, David and Sevilla remained near Indolera uh, to carry on alone, then Sevilla found herself pregnant in the middle of the primitive wilderness. Uh, when the time came for her to deliver, the village chief softened enough to allow a midwife to help her. And a little, uh, little girl was born whom they named Aina. And the delivery was exhausting. Sevilla flood was already weak from bouts of malaria. So the birthing process was a heavy blow to her system. And she died only 17 days after uh, Aina was born. So at that time, something snapped inside of David Flood. Uh, he dug a crude grave, buried his 27-year-old wife, and then went back down the mountain with his children to the mission statement. And he gave baby Aina to the Ericsons. And as he did so, he snarled, I'm going back to Sweden. I've lost my wife, and I obviously can't take care of this baby. God has ruined my life. And with that, he headed for the port, rejecting not only his calling, but rejecting God himself. Uh, so within eight months, both of the Ericsons were stricken with a mysterious illness, and they died within days of each other. So baby Aina was turned over to an American missionary family who changed her sweetest name to Aggie. I think I liked Aina better. Eventually, they took her back to the United States as uh, she was three years old, and they, they loved her, and they were afraid that if they tried to return to Africa, some legal obstacle would uh, separate her from them. So they decided to stay in country and switch from missionary work to pastoral ministry. And this is how Aggie grew up in South Dakota. As a young woman, she attended North Central Bible College in Minneapolis, and there she met and married a man named Dewey Hurst. So uh, she grew up, <clears throat> uh, years passed, uh, they enjoyed a fruitful ministry, she gave birth to a daughter, then a son, eventually her husband became president of a Christian college in the Seattle area, and uh, she was happy to find that there was a, a large Scandinavia, Scandinavian presence there. One day she found a Swedish religious magazine in her mailbox. She had no idea who sent it. So as she's reading through it, she, of course she couldn't read the words. She didn't know what it was saying. Uh, but a, uh, a picture caught her eye. And it was a picture of a, a grave with a white cross. And the, on the cross were the words, Sevilla Flood. <coughs> actually a good story. I just, it's difficult. 
So she didn't. She she recognized the name. She got in her car. She went to the college. She found somebody that could speak Swedish, and she said, uh, "What's going on here?" And so the guy summarized the story. I guess it's a guy as a teacher. Said the article's about missionaries who went to Africa long ago. A baby was born. The young mother died. Uh, one little African boy was led to Jesus before that. After all the whites had left all the uh, Europeans. The boy grew up, and he finally persuaded the chief to let him build a school in the village. And he gradually won all of his students to Christ. And then the children led their parents to Christ. And uh, even the chief himself, that old crusty guy he became a follower of Jesus so as of the writing of that article there were 600 believers in that village all because of the sacrifice of David and Sevilla flood so there's a lot more that goes into it uh, through all of this time David flood was he had rejected God he had lived his life in rejecting of God he had gone back to Sweden he had remarried he'd had more children but he became an alcoholic. He was drowning his disappointment and his pain in alcohol. So eventually Aggie and her husband were able to travel to Sweden. She was able to look him up. And she, she met with her step-siblings, and they told her, look, you can, you can go talk to him, but he's ill, and, but just don't mention anything about God. Well, she wasn't about to do that. So uh, she met him. Uh, he broke down because he said, I never meant to... Uh, pass you off but she said it's okay God took care of me and he was immediately he was he was resistant but she explained the story to him and said look your sacrifice was not in vain Jesus was never angry at you the Lord blessed everything that you did and in hearing uh, those words and and experiencing her presence he softened, he turned back to the Lord, and within a few weeks after they left, he, he passed away. But it was a few years later that Aggie and her husband were attending an evangelism conference in London when a, a report was given uh, from the country of Zaire, which was the Belgian Congo. Uh, the superintendent of the National Church of Zaire, uh, who was representing some 110,000 baptized Believers, he spoke eloquently of the spread of the gospel in his nation. And so come to find out, uh, after his presentation, Aggie uh, went up and had to talk to him, to him with a translator. But this was the boy. And uh, he said he remembers her birth. He remembers her mother. In fact, he said, to this day, your mother's, her memory is honored by all of us. He said that her mother is the most famous person in our history. We all experience disappointments. There is a great deal of disappointment in life. We cannot deny that. Even if we don't experience as much as maybe Horatio Spafford or David Flood, you will face many disappointments in this life just the same. And at each point, at each disappointment, you will be required to make a choice. You will either choose to get bitter or you will choose to become better. Life may be filled with disappointments, but God does not disappoint. The gospel will not disappoint. It will accomplish exactly what God has determined for it to accomplish in your life and in the lives of all of those that you share it with. That is the reality. That is the power of the gospel. You may not see it at the time. You, like David Flood, may even resist God's will and drown yourself in pity, even in legitimate sorrow. But the day will come when you will see it. 
as you stand before your loving Heavenly Father. You will look back from a vantage point of eternity uh, millions of years from now and recognize and confess that God knew all along what he was doing in your life. And you will see that Jesus Christ was certainly exalted and you will not be disappointed. Let's stand. I, I think the, the, the worst part of this story was the fact that David Flood missed out on everything. And I don't mean just seeing what happened in that little village. He missed out on the presence of Jesus Christ in his own life. Even though God was there, he rejected him. Even though God was there, he resisted him. He allowed the disappointments to get the better of him. But we don't have to because God is in control. And no matter what comes our way, no matter what the situation is, we will magnify Jesus Christ in our life if we just stick with it. Just stick with it. Just trust the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time. And Lord, we pray that through your word, the confidence that we receive from your word, the wisdom and knowledge, the knowledge of your presence, the knowledge of your power, Lord, the knowledge of your ability to uh, not disappoint us. Lord, help us to carry that with us even in the midst of the disappointments of this life. And knowing that, yes, on the one hand, it is part of our condition. On the other hand, all of our investments that we have placed in your care are safe and secure and are paying dividends even today. Lord, we might not get what we want in this life. But Lord, when we have you in our hearts, we have exactly what we need. And Lord, we recognize that uh, we need your Holy Spirit, just as Paul recognized this. And our desire is that we are, will be filled with your Spirit on a daily basis. Lord, that your Spirit would empower us to do your will, that your Spirit would empower us to share the gospel, and that we might see uh, the, the power of the gospel take hold, not just in our lives, but the lives of those around us. Lord, there are people out there that we would never think would be influenced by the gospel. Lord, those are the ones, exactly the ones, that need to hear it. They need to be exposed to it. Lord, we pray that you would allow those opportunities to happen, that you would allow our paths to cross. And Lord, for those who are under the sound of the gospel now, we pray that every heart would be open, that every mind would be focused, and every will would be submitted to yours. And we ask all these things in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Hmm?